On the evening of March 2, 1963, an 18-year-old young woman walked along Marlette Street in Phoenix, Arizona, headed home after working late at a local movie theater. It was shortly after 11 p.m. when she noticed a car drive by and then park about a block ahead. A man exited the vehicle and began walking towards her. As the two approached one another, the man grabbed the young woman, forced her into the car, tied her hands and ankles, then drove to a remote location in the desert where he raped her. Ten days later, that man was identified as 22-year-old Ernesto Miranda. Miranda was arrested at his home and placed in a police lineup with three other men who closely matched his physical appearance. However, the victim could not positively identify Miranda as the man who had kidnapped and raped her. The detectives then escorted Miranda into an interrogation room, where after two hours of questioning, he confessed to having committed the crime. The officers then brought the victim to the room. When asked if the young woman standing in the doorway was the person he had raped, Miranda replied, that's the girl. He was then asked to put his confession in writing. Across the top of the statement was a typewritten disclaimer saying that the suspect was confessing voluntarily, without threats or promises of immunity, and quote, with full knowledge of my legal rights, understanding any statement I make may be used against me. Ernesto Miranda wrote his confession, signed the document, and was taken to jail. So he confessed to the crime after two hours of questioning. Um, and by all accounts, it wasn't particularly coercive. There, no sleep deprivation, no teams and relays of, of folks coming in, good cop, bad cop kind of stuff. And at his trial, his attorney moved that the confession be excluded from evidence because it wasn't voluntarily given. Miranda's counsel's argument is that the police have to inform you of your right not to say anything to them to effectuate the Fifth Amendment right, the right against self-incrimination. The Fifth Amendment privilege basically uh, says that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Well, when we get persons in the back room of the police station, we put them in the hot seat, give them the third degree, have a trained governmental questioner that's trained in tactics, and that person is sitting there alone, not represented by counsel. Inherently, that custodial environment is pressure packed. And the police so successfully get confessions that uh, it, it just looks like it's a consequence of pressure. Miranda was saying, in part, my experience of interrogation actually operated to compel me to offer statements against myself in violation of the Fifth Amendment. That amendment had already been announced as incorporated against the states through the 14th Amendment. So prior to Miranda, the court had already said, although the Fifth Amendment by its terms applies only to the federal government, we have decided that its guarantees against uh, compelled self-incrimination are so fundamental that through the 14th Amendment, we are going to say they apply to the states also. But Miranda was not just relying on the Fifth Amendment. Miranda was also in part relying on some of the Supreme Court's cases um, concerning the right to counsel and the Sixth Amendment. The Supreme Court had said in a case called Escobedo that the Sixth Amendment right to the assistance of counsel in a prosecution actually extends back. It doesn't just apply at the time of a criminal trial. It also applies when someone is um, being questioned, when someone has been arrested and is being questioned as a suspect in a case. Um, that in the course of that questioning, one is entitled to the assistance of counsel. Miranda, of course, had not been provided counsel in the course of his interrogation. Um, he also had not asked for counsel in the course of his interrogation. But if he was right that he had a Sixth Amendment right to counsel, right, then it shouldn't have mattered, the argument went, that he didn't ask for it. And the trial court said, that's ridiculous. And they said, he signed a confession. And at the bottom of the confession says, this is voluntary. A jury found Ernesto Miranda guilty of kidnapping and rape, and he was sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. His attorney immediately appealed the case to the Arizona Supreme Court, claiming that Miranda's confession had been unconstitutionally obtained. But the Arizona Supreme Court disagreed and upheld the conviction. Eventually, the case of Miranda versus Arizona was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court.
However, this appeal was not made on the basis that Miranda's confession was false or coerced. Instead, his lawyers argued that Miranda would not have confessed if he had been advised of his right to remain silent and of his right to an attorney. Prior to um, Miranda, the admissibility of confessions was largely controlled by the due process clause. Uh, if the police engaged in physically abusive tactics, torture to get a confession, uh, that confession was regarded to be a violation of due process. Um, and the court would call it an involuntary confession. Arizona said, we didn't make him say anything. We didn't compel him to say anything. We asked him questions about a, a criminal activity. He willingly responded to those questions. At no point did he say, I don't want to talk anymore. At no point did he say, I want to see an attorney before I talk. Um, he has these rights under the federal constitution, but he didn't invoke those rights. It's not our job to invoke those rights for him or to give him information that would lead him to invoke rights. And the question that um, uh, the court was attempting to address in Miranda is, well, just because we don't torture somebody, um, if we engage in some psychological tactics that are designed to, where, where officers are trained how to get the confession, um, is, is how can it be truly voluntary if people don't know what their rights are in that situation? And um, uh, the, the, the concern was that even a confession that might be voluntary in a limited sense, that the police didn't torture it out of a suspect, uh, that that confession may not be in compliance with the Fifth Amendment privilege against compelled self-incrimination. The justices of the Supreme Court in Miranda's case ultimately decided that, in fact, Miranda's confession did have to be excluded from evidence, um, could not be introduced against him in his criminal trial. And they said the reason for that was that the confession um, violated the Fifth Amendment, violated Miranda's right against compelled self-incrimination. And the reason why the court said that it violated that right was because the police had failed to take a number of measures to affirmatively advise Miranda of his rights in order to ensure that he was um, both sort of aware of uh, his right not to um, speak against himself, aware of his right to have an attorney uh, with him during the questioning if he wanted, um, aware of his right to um, terminate the questioning if he wanted, um, and, uh, and the, the failure of the police to affirmatively apprise Miranda of those rights um, meant that his confession was compelled, was not offered um, uh, sufficiently voluntarily within the meaning of, of the Fifth Amendment. By a 5-4 vote, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Ernesto Miranda's conviction. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice Earl Warren stated, We hold that when an individual is taken into custody or otherwise deprived of his freedom by the authorities and is subjected to questioning, the privilege against self-incrimination is jeopardized. He must be warned prior to any questioning that he has the right to remain silent, that anything he says can be used against him in a court of law, that he has the right to the presence of an attorney, and that if he cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for him prior to any questioning if he so desires. Opportunity to exercise these rights must be afforded to him throughout the interrogation unless and until such warnings and waiver are demonstrated by the prosecution at trial, no evidence obtained as a result of interrogation can be used against him. Warren's opinion starts out by assessing police manuals in terms of how to garner confessions. And in fact, the bulk of Warren's opinion talks about those manuals and the practices and the strategies of eliciting confessions from people. Warren goes through these manuals and says there are elements of coercion in all of these techniques, 
to elicit confessions. And in fact, the entire process of questioning is inherently coercive. You're in the control of the police. Oftentimes you're in a police station, you're in a police car. And so what Warren says is that this entire context is coercive. The United States Supreme Court is not saying that Mr. Miranda's confession is inherently unreliable. They're not saying that the confession may not have been truthful. Um, they're not saying that the confession was beaten out of him and truly um, um, coerced. What the court is saying, though, is that the way 20th century and now 21st century police interrogation works, it carries with it, the court says, a badge of intimidation. That it's the custodial interrogation environment that is so pressure packed that if you don't tell people what their rights are, it is going to produce confessions under circumstances that do not sufficiently safeguard the Fifth Amendment privilege against compelled self-incrimination. This was the source then of what we all know to be sort of the famous Miranda warnings, right? What the court announced in Miranda was actually um, that the, the police had to, had to take a number of steps, right, in order to um, then proceed with custodial interrogation of the type they did with Miranda. The court said the police must advise a defendant, right, that the defendant has the right to remain silent, that any statements the defendant makes may be used against him in a court, that the defendant has a right to an attorney, that an attorney will be provided if the defendant cannot afford one. The court also said the police must advise the defendant that he may terminate the question at any time, right, um, including in the middle. Right, so uh, there's no um, right to terminate the questioning that's sort of waived if one starts answering questions and then decides they don't want to do it anymore. You can say, I'm done, and the court, the, the police must advise you of that right, and the police must respect the um, decision to terminate questioning. But the, the important thing in Miranda, probably more important than the reading of the rights, is the court decision that the defendant can then voluntarily and, and knowingly waive those rights and go ahead and confess. And he doesn't need an attorney in the room with him telling him whether it's a good idea. Most defendants, uh, something like 65% of them, will go ahead and waive those rights and talk anyway. And they do that for a lot of reasons. Mostly they think they can outsmart the cops and come up with some uh, excuse or alibi that's gonna let them walk out of the room. That very, very rarely happens, uh, but they think that's going to happen. But it, it, it changes the dynamic. At least it, it lets the defendant know uh, these people, these cops aren't going to beat him up. You know, they're going to listen to him. They're going to protect his rights uh, if, if he invokes them. And then the police officers just have to hope he doesn't invoke them. The four dissenting justices argued that the majority's view of police interrogations was exaggerated and that the decision would ultimately inhibit the ability of law enforcement to protect society by detecting and punishing criminal behavior. In the dissenting opinion, Justice Byron White was joined by Justices Tom Clark, John Marshall Harlan II, and Potter Stewart when he wrote, There is the not-so-subtle overtone of the opinion that it is inherently wrong for the police to gather evidence from the accused himself. I see nothing wrong or immoral, and certainly nothing unconstitutional, with the police asking a suspect whom they have reasonable cause to arrest, whether or not he killed his wife, or with confronting him with the evidence on which the arrest was based. These ends of society are served by the criminal law, which for the most part is aimed at the prevention of crime. The Miranda decision was an extremely controversial ruling at the time. Um, there were a number of reasons for it. One was that it was a particularly um, dramatic example of the court um, fairly self-consciously going beyond what the text of the Constitution requires, right? So these warnings, aren't anywhere in the Fifth Amendment. They're not in the 14th Amendment, right? They don't appear by their terms any place in the Constitution. And um, 
It's not the only example, by any stretch of the imagination, of a case where the court has said, the Constitution says X, in order to decide whether the government has done X, we're gonna have this rule that we'll use, right? And that'll help us know whether they've done X or not. The Miranda warnings end up being that rule. But the Miranda warnings are quite lengthy, fairly specific, and are fairly far from the actual text of, of, of the Fifth Amendment. That led people to say, this is the court overreaching in a very dramatic way, going beyond what a judge or nine judges are supposed to do, which is simply sort of interpret the law, and instead doing more like what legislators are supposed to do, which is coming up with rules for how police or prosecutors should do their job, right? And that, many people said, was, was illegitimate, going too far. Officers at the time uh, thought that they wouldn't be able to get confessions if they advised defendants of their rights. They thought this would radically change uh, how, how law enforcement uh, is engaged in in this country, and that just turned out not to be true. So at the time, uh, you know, they, they thought everybody, every criminal defendant would say, okay, uh, I invoke my right to remain silent. Okay, sure, I'll take an attorney, uh, and that confessions would, would end. It turns out officers are able to just fold these Miranda warnings into how they conduct custodial interrogations in a way that, that has ended up having no effect statistically on the number of confessions. So the, the number of people who will uh, waive their rights and talk is the same percentage as the people who would, who would have confessed uh, prior to Miranda. The Fifth Amendment privilege is that the government lacks the power to call the defendant to the witness stand as a witness against himself at that person's criminal case. And the result of that is that in most criminal trials in America, the jury never hears from the defendant. And all Miranda did in 1966 was sort of reset the balance in a way that the court believed the framers intended. That's what the Miranda warnings do. Those warnings are simply designed to ensure that an individual is given the same consideration in the back room of the police station that the Fifth Amendment has always given that individual in the courtroom. After the U.S. Supreme Court's historic ruling in Miranda versus Arizona, Ernesto Miranda was retried, and this time, the state did not introduce his confession into evidence. Nevertheless, he was once again found guilty of kidnapping and rape and sentenced to 20 to 30 years in an Arizona state prison. Miranda was paroled in 1972, and after his release, had several more run-ins with the law. Then one January evening in 1976, Ernesto Miranda was stabbed to death when a fight broke out at a local bar. He was 36 years old. As one of the men accused of killing Miranda was placed in handcuffs, the arresting officer pulled a small laminated card from his pocket and began to read the suspect his Miranda rights. <laughs> 